Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Um, today I'm going to tell you about the relation of two things that a lot of people don't associate re readily, um, that's law and fashion. Lawyers are not particularly known for their fashion sense, but I have been working for the past um, several years with my friend Scott Hemphill, who's um, a professor at Columbia Law School. The two of us have been researching uh, innovation and law in the fashion industry. And Scott and I actually clerked together on the Supreme Court, he for Justice Scalia and me for Justice Souter. And among those two justices, I would, I would be proud to say that it was the New England Yankee who was the much better dressed. <laughs> so a year after clerking for Justice Souter, I was a prosecutor in Manhattan. And there I, I prosecuted a whole variety of different crimes. And one of the crimes that I, I often found myself um, prosecuting there was um, trademark counterfeiting cases. And so people were being put in jail for selling fake Gucci and Prada bags. And you know, I, I, I thought that was a little harsh. But I, um, I wanted to Get, I wanted to get to the bottom of what is this about, right? If, if we're going to put people in jail, what, what is it that we think we're doing? What are the interests that we're protecting? And that was, my, that was the beginning of my interest in fashion law. So fashion, it's one of the most important creative industries in the world. It has, uh, it's a global business with apparel, accessory shoes, numbering about uh, $200 billion. Um, in U.S. sales alone, which is more than books, music, and movies combined. Um, there are over 14,000 companies in the U.S. that employ about 4 million people. And the other thing about fashion is that it has this weird paradox embedded in it, which is that we often people talk about fashion and style as if it was their own individual thing. Like, this is the way I am, and this is the way I like to present myself, and there's a, there's a real individuality about the way people experience fashion in their lives. At the same time, we, as we know, fashion is about trends and about, and about following the group and about doing things together and conforming in some way. So it has this weird tension in it that it is, it's about individuality, it's about self-expression, at the same time it's about moving along with others. And I think that that central tension runs not only through fashion but a lot of the arts. And so I think that what it, fashion's kind of a metaphor for, for human creative activity, because on the one hand, to be, to be creative, you're kind of different from everybody else, but on the other hand, creativity can't exist without building on the work of other people who came before you and also being in conversation with those around you. So there's this ebb and flow of trends where new things come into the horizon and then people flock to those new things and then the new things kind of become old and people lose their fascination and they move on to something else. And that process, that, that cycle of new and old, I think, is also um, fascinating. So original creation, in, whether it's in books, music, uh, movies, photography, it's always indebted to some prior work. Fashion, too, involves borrowing and influence. And I think that for a lot of people, that's, that's very visible, that fashion is about um, being influenced by the culture, being influenced by prior work. So, but unlike movies, books, and, and music, fashion design is not protected by United States copyright law. So let's, let's look at a couple of things. Um, here we have Michelle Obama looking lovely in her inauguration ball gown. And when she wore, wore this ball gown, everyone, everyone thought, who, who made this ball gown? Who, who is the designer? And it turned out it was this young emerging designer who was not famous, um, Jason Wu. And um, of course, immediately after, we got the <laughs> knockoff um, by ABS, an exact knockoff of the dress, very, very soon after. And, um, and now Jason Wu is, is pretty well known. And as you know, there's the, the phenomenon of Oscar dresses that are immediately knocked off the morning after they are, they are um, displayed on, on television. This is very common. And then 
dresses that appear on the runway. This is a Versace dress that retails for some, um, so $1,000, $1,500. And then here is the BB copy of the dress. And now sometimes you think about you think about knockoffs and you think about really expensive dresses and knockoffs of those, but actually a lot of times it's dresses that are retailing in the hundreds rather than the thousands. And actually those dresses are the most vulnerable to copying. And the reason is that those designers, right, they're, they're emerging designers who are not yet well known. When you've got a famous designer who is charging thousands rather than hundreds, copies are not necessarily competition for them because the, the buyers of those thousand dollar dresses are not really going to substitute a fifty dollar knockoff for that thousand dollar dress. Whereas if you've got a four hundred dollar dress, it might be a reach for somebody who could afford it. Um, but that person might say, well, there's a $40 knockoff. That's, that's a pretty good substitute, right? So the competition created by copies actually affects mid-level, lesser known designers more than the famous household names. So now, let's look at the next one. Now, Forever 21 is a notorious copyist. And in fact, the business model of Forever 21 is, is to take uh, take a designer dress and to make an exact knockoff of it, right? They don't try to make modifications. They actually just try to replicate, right? And this is perfectly legal under U.S. copyright law. There's nothing illegal about doing that. Right? This is Carol Hockman in Forever 21. Another Forever 21 example, um, a Chloe boot and Forever 21 version of it. And here we have um, a Balenciaga shoe. This is called the Lego shoe. It was retailing for four, $4,175. And there was a $99 knockoff by Steve Madden. Um, and let's see. OK, and then here is a Diane von Furstenberg dress and a Forever 21 copy of it. Right? Now, Diane von Furstenberg is the president of the Council of Fashion Designers of America. And that organization has been devoted to fighting design piracy and, um, and trying to lobby Congress to change the law, to add fashion design as a category that would be protected by copyright law. Now, a couple of years ago, Diane von Furstenberg produced a jacket, the one on the right, 2009. And that jacket was on the market. And then suddenly, people started saying, wait, it looks a lot like this jacket by Mercy was a smaller, a Canadian emerging designer. Um, and in fact, it turned out that somebody in Diane von Furstenberg's design studio had copied from Mercy. And this was embarrassing because Diane von Furstenberg had been leading the, um, the charge against piracy in fashion design. And she promptly apologized and paid Mercy an undisclosed sum of money, even though she was not required to. Right? If, she, if she had copied this, which it was clear that the designer had, it was perfectly legal under both US and Canadian law. So what, now, copying is not a new problem. It's, been, it's, it's plagued the fashion industry since the beginning, since the early 20th century when, American, uh, when Americans started um, designing clothes. It was always, it was always a, a common practice. People would go to trade shows, and they would make sketches of designs, and then they would, they would create fast copies. But what has changed is that we have um, computing that makes uh, shows available online. You can watch the shows. You can create the pattern faster. And electronic communication gives you great access to the collections, and then, there's, and then you can email things over to overseas manufacturers. And then, of course, transportation of goods has become faster. And then also starting from the late, from the mid-90s, you had a gradual phase out of quotas, um, of trade quotas. And so the result has been that we have a new model, relatively new model, of fashion businesses called fast fashion. And fast fashion uh, consists of uh, people who basically make in relatively inexpensive 
inexpensive clothes that draw on the trends. Some fast fashion companies explicitly, like Forever 21, undertake to copy, to replicate exactly what the designers are doing. Other fast fashion businesses don't replicate. They avoid replicating, but what they do is they try to go with the trend and be inspired by the designs that are um, being created by the original designers. So now, should fashion be one of the things that US copyright law protects? Right? The, the fashion industry itself seems to be sending mixed messages. Um, it's very common for those of you who read fashion magazines that you could open a magazine and you would see some editorial uh, spread like this, which is showing one um, under the splurge heading, uh, an outfit that uh, might be might be expensive, and then and then another version that's pretty much an exact copy that that is less expensive, and this is a very common editorial form, right? You've got the dress for $1,000 and um, 245 copy by ABS. Again, here, same idea. And on the other hand, there, there has been a campaign in the fashion industry to fight this uh, phenomenon of design piracy. And designers themselves are divided. Some designers say that they, that, uh, Piracy cuts our, out our legs from underneath us in terms of building a brand and identity. You have Narciso Rodriguez, who is also expressing dismay about knockoffs. But then you've got Marc Jacobs saying that copying is fantastic, right? And uh, we've, it's, always, it's always the state of fashion that people copy. And you know, that's, if, you, if someone copies you, it's flattering. You know that it's, you've created something that's, that's meaningful, that's desirable. So now let's look at the protection, the regime that we, ha we do have, right? So intellectual property consists of three components. One is patent, one is trademark, one is copyright. Patent is for inventors, right? And, and you get an exclusive right under law if you invent something that's novel um, and unique, and it's, um, it's, you have to, you get to use it for a limited time before you, before you release it to the public. Copyright is for creative works um, like books, music, movies, films. Trademark is for signs that identify the source of the, the seller, the, the person who, who created the thing, right? So here what you have is an example. Right? A trademark would be like the interlocking Gs of the Gucci symbol. Um, and what you've got here is this pattern. Right, this pattern some of you may recognize is a distinctive Burberry check. Right, Burberry is the company, and what what that does is that it it is a trademark. It functions to identify the source of the good. Right, when you see that check, you think Burberry. Right, and that's a trademark. It also falls in in copyright because copyright will protect. A pattern like that. It will say, um, well, there's this is a it's just like it would with a painting. If you if you make a drawing on a canvas and you create a design, that would be protected and that pattern would be protected by copyright law. However, the jacket or the pants or the dress or the trench coat that might be created using that pattern would not be protected under US law. And the reason is that it's considered a useful article. Right? And it's, it's a useful article, and useful articles are not protected under federal copyright law, except to the extent that their usefulness, their utilitarian aspect, is completely separable conceptually from the ways in which they are um, artistic. And here you've got something that might be covered by, conceivably by all three cop, uh, intellectual property regimes in that it's a pattern, so it could, be, it could fall under copyright. It's a, um, trademark, the, the, the logos, and it could, be, uh, it could be patentable if it's a fabric that actually is a novel fabric, right? That's not just a standard fabric. So here you've got um, a trademark bag, Louis Vuitton, and you know, I prosecuted a bunch of people selling these kinds of things. And this is, this is protected by, by US trademark law because 
this serves to identify the source of the maker, right? The, so the Louis Vuitton bag is protected. And if you copy it and just change it a little, right, is that okay? Well, actually, there's also something called trade dress. And under trade dress, what you have is, even if it's not just the logo, right, the, the LV or the interlocking Gs, if the whole thing overall, right, the way that it looks serves to identify the source, then you also have trade dress protection, right? So if you look at the bag, and without even focusing on the fact that the, the letters say L and V, if you think Louis Vuitton, then, then you've got a trade dress uh, claim. So for contrast, look at this. So you've got a bag here on the left by Foley and Corinna. Um, no trademark, um, no design copy, copyright protection, because it doesn't exist. And is, is there trade dress? No. And the reason is because you don't look at this bag. You might think of a variety of things. You might think, oh, I don't like this bag, or you might think it's, it's a cool bag, but you don't think Foley and Corinna, right? Because it doesn't have that recognizability. It doesn't have that public um, image. And so this bag has basically falls um, in a no copyright place, right? There's no, no protection for this designer. Recently we have, what we have going on is a lawsuit between Christian Louboutin and Yves Saint Laurent. And basically the, Christian Louboutin has um, a trademark in its red sole, right? Underneath the shoe. And Yves Saint Laurent started making a red sole underneath their shoes. And Christian Louboutin said, no, we, the red sole is actually identifying our products as our products. And so if you start using the red on your shoe, people will think that they are Christian Louboutin. And so that suit is currently going on. They lost, they, they lost their claim in federal district court in New York and just yesterday filed an appeal in the Second Circuit in New York. So we're gonna see that, um, that court address that issue of whether you can trademark red in your soul. Um, the basic point here is that not, the copying is selective. The most vulnerable to copying are the mid-range designers who make things where the copy actually would compete with the, with the product, right? If you're making a very expensive product or a product that has a, a whole lot of status where people who are buying it want the real thing, right? Then the copy is not that much of a threat. And in terms of copyists, there are all these fast fashion companies, but only some of them engage in knocking off in an exact way. Others try to participate in the trend and to be inspired by, right? So I think there's a big distinction to be made here between knockoffs and inspired buys. I'm gonna skip this because of time. Okay, so we have, we, we don't have copyright protection for fashion design, but, but Europe does. And um, they, pr they protect the appearance of the whole or part of a product resulting from the features of the particular, the line, basically the design. Um, and in France, for example, individual states, including France, includes explicitly fashion design among the things that are protected by its intellectual property code. And so under, under French law, um, in the 90s, you had this lawsuit between Ralph Lauren and Yves Saint Laurent and Ralph Lauren was producing a $1,000 version of this tuxedo dress, and Yves Saint Laurent claimed that it was a copy of its $15,000 tuxedo dress. And um, Yves Saint Laurent prevailed in French court um, on, on this lawsuit. Recently, we had uh, Isabelle Marant and Naf Naf on the right. That dress on the right was considered to be an infringing copy under French intellectual property law. Um, and and Naf Naf was ordered to pay $120,000 to Isabel Morant. Now, if you ask me, I, 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 I would be a little bit troubled by those lawsuits in that they seem to be pretty, I mean, a tuxedo dress, uh, a black, a little black mini dress, it doesn't seem to be 
distinctive enough to, to say you can't copy from it. Because the, the tension is that you have to allow a lot of material to be open and to be available for use by creators, right? to, to take inspiration and to derive, um, to, you know, to, to derive their creative influences. And you don't want to lock up a whole bunch of influences so that people can't use them to create. At the same time, the whole idea be behind intellectual property law is that you want to give creators an incentive to create, and you will do that if they know that they can profit from their original creation, because they've invested time into and, and labor, energy, into creating that thing, and they want to know that they will be the ones to profit from it. So what we have in Congress right now is um, a bill. And I, I had the opportunity to go to con Congress um, this summer and to testify on the bill. And it's called the Innovation Design Protection Privacy Prevention Act. And it, it proposes, basically, to um, add copyright to, to add, add copyright for fashion design. And so here, the ordinary copyright standard for books, music, and film would be that it's, a, it's an infringing copy if it is substantially similar to the original. And what this, what this law propo uh, proposes to do is to create an infringement standard that would say that a design is infringing if it is substantially identical in overall appearance. Right? So if it's a substantially identical standard, I don't think those, those two dresses that we saw, the, the tuxedo dress and the black mini dress, I don't think that those would be infringing because they wouldn't, they wouldn't be substantially identical. They'd be substantially similar, sure. But if you ban similarity, that would be like banning fashion itself. And here um, you have an originality standard that says not everything. You can't copyright everything. You can't copyright a pinstripe suit. You can't copyright um, a pair of jeans. Right? You have to provide something that's unique, distinguishable, non-trivial, and non-utilitarian variation over prior design. Right? And, and that's, so you limit the number of things that will be protected, and then you create a very narrow standard so that infringement um, is not happening all over the place. And so when you see that kind of effort, and, and you look at these designs, and you think um, some of them would infringe, some of them wouldn't, is this substantially similar? Maybe, but it may not be substantially identical under the new proposed standard. Um, and we, we'll see whether Congress ends up passing the law. Um, and eventually, we may have copyright protection for fashion design. And I think that the reason I'm fascinated by this is because it, it makes us reflect on what intellectual property protection is for, what it is for human beings to do things that are creative and expressive, but at the same time to have, have ways that they, they want to be like other people. Thank you.